So when Justice Scalia dies, right. uh, Leader McConnell uh, makes, very quickly makes an announcement that uh, uh, they're going to wait, the Republicans are going to wait. What did you think of that announcement? You know, I, I started to look at the history and, and found that that was not unprecedented, but, uh, but I wasn't sure it was r the right thing to do either. But it was, you know, Leader McConnell was set on it. And uh, we way, all in the Judiciary Committee went along with it. In what way didn't you think it was right? What questions well, did you Well, I about? just, I, I didn't like the, you know, the entire you know, past 15 years of, uh, you know, not wanting to give uh, the President's executive calendar a, a vote on the Senate floor. Ever since 2003, you know, we've been doing this back and forth, whoever was in charge, and getting worse and worse and worse in terms of, uh, you know, actually allowing that calendar to get to the floor, the president's nominees. And I just thought that this wouldn't help with the, that development at all. What was your thought about uh, uh, McConnell's long game? What was, what, was, what was he thinking? What was he playing there? Well, I don't know that he knew what effect it would have on the election. I would argue it had a big effect on the election. Uh, but he knew that it would help. It would help rally the base. Uh, this is something that uh, you know, would, would uh, you know, cause people to come out and vote for the president um, and or vote for the Republican nominee. Now, at that point, uh, we didn't know that it would be Trump. We weren't sure. Mm. Um, but, uh, but he knew that that would help the Republican cause. There's a, uh, we've talked to people who say the amazing thing was that uh, Garland was such a, a, a moderate choice. Right. It would have been, everybody could have seen him yeah. maybe coming from uh, uh, McConnell yeah. uh, moving it through the process. Yeah, I mean, that's a person who would have gotten 98 votes or 100 votes in the 1990s just a few years before. And uh, I, as we went along, I, I became more and more unsettled <laughs> by that uh, decision. I met with Merrick Garland. Uh, I liked him. Um, I talked to some of his colleagues on the night, or on the, uh, the uh, DC circuit and, and knew that he was a conservative, uh, frankly, uh, choice for a uh, Democratic president. Uh, so he, he would have been certainly a mainstream choice. One of the questions, of course, that people raises, how did McConnell keep all of you in the box, in line? Well, I think once uh, the Judiciary Committee had made the decision we're not going to have a hearing, then we just stuck to it. Um, now, as we got closer to the election, and you know, Trump was our nominee, and virtually nobody thought that, uh, that we would win, uh, then I thought at that time, uh, let's, it's time to, to change that. Let's bring him forward. I actually advocated uh, in September, October, of returning to Merrick Garland, uh, thinking that if uh, Hillary Clinton becomes president, uh, the choice will certainly be somebody not as mainstream as Merrick Garland. And so I started floating that out there. I also got a call from Barack Obama and uh, during that time uh, to say, well, how about during the uh, lame duck session? Uh, <laughs> if uh, Hillary Clinton is the, the president-elect, uh, surely Republicans uh, would, would go that, at that point. And, I thought that that was right, and uh, I actually drafted a letter uh, which was ready to go uh, the morning after the election. So I was ready to hit send at 12.01 um, after Hillary Clinton had been you know, elected president to say, hey, you know, Republicans, uh, let's, uh, let's move Merrick Garland in the lame duck. It, it seemed that uh, Barack Obama had received an assurance from uh, Hillary Clinton that um, she would be okay with that. that uh, she would likely get another choice or two, and, and that would be all right. And so I was ready to move with that, and I think some of my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee would have been as well. Let's go to the Kavanaugh uh, <coughs> nomination. When they pick, when he picks, I mean, Gorsuch sort of sails through, and he's, everybody's kind of conservative. Right. Uh, Kavanaugh comes along, and, and immediately the Democrats are, within hours, are saying, right. this is an evil person, we've yeah. got to stop it. Uh, you've tried for moderation throughout and, and, and uh, bipartisanship throughout right. your career. Uh, were you worried about Kavanaugh from the very beginning? No, um, I, I knew that that would be the reaction that the Democrats had. And frankly, I think they made a, you know, a big mistake with Gorsuch um, they, you know, in immediately opposing him and uh, you know, threatening to filibuster. And I think they, they, they should have known that he was a, 
mainstream popular choice. He performed very well with the committee, and uh, and they should have known he would uh, because he <coughs> Gorsuch was not controversial uh, politically. The Democrats uh, probably should have just let that one go, realizing that, that the next pick, which turned out to be Kavanaugh, would have much more of an impact, the the real swing vote on the court. But they didn't. So when when Kavanaugh came. And that was immediately the reaction. I think most of the country thought, well, there they go again. Mm. And no matter who was picked by the president, uh, they're going to have that reaction. The rollout of uh, Kavanaugh um, at the White House was, was good, like it was for Gorsuch. I mean, the, the White House, uh, keep in mind, I mean, when Gorsuch was nominated, they had just been through the travel ban fiasco. Mm. And it seemed that nothing could be done well over there. Gorsuch was rolled out, and that was a professional operation, much like you'd seen in previous administrations. And uh, that was the case with Kavanaugh as well. Uh, they, the White House counsel consulted with members of the Judiciary Committee, made sure people felt they were informed, uh, invited them to the White House. Uh, and so that, that was ruled out well. And I thought when Kavanaugh was nominated uh, that, uh, you know, you saw him up there with his family. Um, you know, I thought that that it, politically uh, if you just put aside everything else, it was rolled out well, and it would be di difficult to really oppose him, particularly because the Democrats had gone all in against uh, Gorsuch. Mm. You know, that first day, I watched the video of the first session, Grassley tap, tap, tap. Suddenly, people in the crowd yelling, the Democrats are jumping all over, and right. we got 62,000 documents just last night. Put yourself in that room for me and, and tell me what your emotional and political reactions yeah. were to what was unfolding right there as soon as things got started. Right. Well, uh, you could see the protesters waiting at the back. You just didn't know when they would erupt. You knew they would, uh, one at a time, uh, two mm -hmm. at a time. Um, we were interrupted uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of times during that, uh, that process. But that was, I tell you, it was big drama. Uh, that room, uh, were more cameras. Uh, you could barely hear for the clicking uh, whenever the, the, the judge would turn his head or, or make a motion that they wanted to capture. Uh, so it was, uh, it was high drama. Um, and uh, frankly, uh, you know, the, the questions, the way the Democrats started in, um, very few had uh, not made up their mind, it seemed. They were all in, many had you know, said that they were against, and even there were some flyers out there apparently with the, the fill in the name, <laughs> just <laughs> the, the blank, we will oppose, you know, yeah. whomever. And, yeah. and that didn't uh, augur in their favor when allegations came out, because I think most of the country concluded that the Democrats would be against anyone and that they would use any pretext uh, to take anyone down. So that, that, uh, that didn't, uh, you know, didn't work in their favor in the end. You were on the bubble in some ways. The clock was ticking for Leader McConnell. The midterms were right. looming. You, Joe Manchin, Susan Collins, uh, uh, Lisa Murkowski. Tell me about, I mean, I, I don't know if you were really on the bubble or if he knew you were somebody he wanted to pay special attention to. We've talked to people who said he was watching Flake, he was watching yeah. Collins, he was yeah. w uh, watching Murakowski. Are you talking about before the allegations? Or this is before yes. Blasey Ford. Yeah, well, I, I was concerned, obviously I have my concerns with this president and with the White House and what he might do regarding uh, the investigation. Uh, I wanted to make sure that his views on presidential power and separation of powers uh, were, uh, you know, where they should be. Um, there was a lot of uh, concern on the left, and uh, the Democrats were concerned that he uh, would simply, uh, you know, dance with who brought him there, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, would be far more prone to uh, to side with the president on issues. So that was, you know, I, I wanted to to make sure that that was not the case as well. Uh, so. I studied up quite a bit. Uh, I asked him about this issue in public and in private. And uh, I, I was satisfied in the end with the Hamdan case. And uh, he kept saying over and over that uh, one of the decisions he admired most was uh, U.S. versus Nixon, mm. um, indicating that uh, certainly the court uh, uh, stands supreme there and, uh, and shouldn't be bullied by a president. So. In the end, I, I felt good about it, but I, I, I think he was concerned uh, 
because of my concern uh, with this White House and uh, them you know, wanting to use the courts uh, to further their ends. The, when, when Dr. Blasey Ford is, uh, testifies, right. does the tenor of the room change? Do you, does it emotionally grab you in, in a way yes. that is surprising to you? And what actually happened there? In the, I'm really talking about reaction to it rather than... Yeah, you know. it was impossible not to be uh, riveted <laughs> um, with her testimony. She was compelling. Um, it, that was that was impactful. It really was. So uh, I, uh, I think I shared that with all of my colleagues. Uh, I think everyone felt the same. That was a big deal. You think it changed anything? Yeah, it, it did. When I heard the news the the Sunday before that she'd come out with these allegations, I immediately said she needed to testify. I knew that we couldn't pass it off. Some of my colleagues felt that, no, this was just drummed up by the other side. We shouldn't hear her. I knew we had to. Um, I'm glad she did testify. Uh, then some said, well, if she can testify, but it has to be tomorrow or the next day, and right. let's stick to our schedule. I never saw that schedule as that important. But it did, it did uh, move people, and we had a meeting, uh, a break, right after her testimony or during her testimony at one point. And I could tell that my colleagues were moved, and they were saying, I, you know, he'd better be good. <laughs> um, he'd better have an answer because uh, she uh, sounds very credible. And his reaction, his rebuttal? Well, I mean, that was uh, a tour de force, I think, in terms of uh, indignation. And uh, to, to some of us, it made us wince, it did me. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I tried to put myself in his position and say, how would I feel if I felt that I was wrongly accused? And that's the kind of reaction I would probably have. I probably wouldn't have blamed the Clintons or, or uh, you know, made some of the other statements he did, but I would be indignant. So that seemed very compelling and believable as well, if not a little overboard. Uh, so he, he, he answered it. And, uh, and I think most of my colleagues felt like I did. If, if we had been accused of something like that, that we felt was unjustified. Uh, uh, I, in many ways, I, I told my family and others, that's the way I hope I would act. Um, we, we've seen examples in the past of uh, uh, you know, those who, you know, the famous one with Michael Dukakis, when somebody asked if somebody in your family had been and uh, raped or whatever, how would you feel? And it was just kind of a cerebral, you know, response that, that uh, you know, just doesn't, didn't seem real. This seemed real, at least, that, that he had felt that he had been un unjustly accused. In that back and forth, especially with White House and, and Booker and others, he and, and Klobuchar, he's pretty intense coming back and yes. forth. Uh, it's almost like something has really dramatically changed. If all of this was different yeah. in some way, m even worse than Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill, yeah. it felt like this was more in the world of Trump land, right? In yeah, in and that, that was, frankly, my biggest concern. Uh, with regard to the allegations, uh, I've said before, and I, I maintain that position, that we could never be sure what happened uh, 36 years before uh, by uh, you know, teenagers who, uh, by all accounts, had been drinking. Um, does anybody really know? Uh, could anybody be certain what happened? I don't think so. Uh, but, but we did see how he reacted in the committee. And should that have been disqualifying, uh, given the fact that we can't have you know, a partisan Supreme Court? Yeah. Um, for myself, I looked at that and, and I saw the reaction that he had to the allegations. And as I mentioned, that's how you would expect, I think, somebody to react if they'd been wrongly accused. Did he go overboard? Yes. But then you weigh that against his behavior on the court that he's been serving on uh, for, the, for over a decade. Yeah. And I checked with some of his colleagues, too. Is that really him? Uh, is that how he acts? And to a person, uh, it was no. He had been the model of decorum and decency hmm. during his entire time. That's not just from his colleagues, but from clerks, from plaintiffs, anybody who had dealt with him. 
And so it was totally inconsistent with the record that he had had as a judge. And, and that meant something to me. Let's talk about the elevator ride, the famous mm -hmm. elevator ride. How, how was that? I, I, I don't know how else to ask it. What was it like? <laughs> no, it was uh, obviously intense. It was, I had just uh, announced just a few minutes before that, that I would uh, uh, vote to advance his nomination. Uh, but I was obviously unsettled by it. Um, I'd been hearing from, I mean, extended family members and, and others uh, with their own stories. And I think all of my colleagues had had this experience. Uh, I knew that the country uh, was unsettled. Um, and and I, I didn't feel uh, good about where we were, particularly that we couldn't just let the FBI investigate and make us all feel better in this regard. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the reasons given by our leadership just didn't uh, sit well with me. What reasons? Uh, well, that uh, the Mark Judge, uh, the one that everyone wanted the FBI to talk to, had lawyered up or he uh, couldn't be talked to, and, uh, and we couldn't go down that road. We were told that again and again. And uh, Who tells th you that? Well, that was the, our leadership. Uh, they said he just can't. And we, some of us were troubled the night before that the affidavit that he had signed, he hadn't signed. His lawyers did. Why couldn't he sign it? Does it have the same legal standing? We were assured yes, but... Uh, but then all of a sudden, within an hour or so, we had a signed copy by him. Some of us thought, if he can sign that copy, then he can be reached and, uh, mm. and you know, there's no reason not to talk to him. So I, you know, I went into that elevator still very troubled by the decision that I'd made, not necessarily on the, the merits of the, I guess, the, the, the case, but that the country was being ripped apart here. And the ride in the elevator just reaffirmed that. And then I got to the committee and there was an all out food fight going on with uh, you know, Republicans taking their time to just blast away at the Democrats for, for uh, the way they had handled this. And Democrats uh, you know, saying, hey, you're not uh, doing due diligence on this and you're not, uh, you, know, you haven't done right by uh, you know, the people. And, uh, and then I heard uh, Chris Coons give his speech. And by, you know, in contrast to everything else, uh, it was a very measured and uh, sober you know, recitation of you know, what we had done and what we hadn't done. Why couldn't we have a week-long investigation? The Anita Hill investigation was only four days. Uh, why couldn't we go and just to have a, a an investigation that was limited in time and in scope, and uh, and it would make the country feel better, and uh, that rang true to me. I'm very close to Chris Coons. We travel a lot together, and we know each other well and trust each other. And so that's when I went and asked if we could speak outside. Susan Collins seems to be the person yeah. in the middle, that it's really going to come down maybe to yeah. her vote. This is if you're the leader, you're sitting there counting heads and you say, I've got Flake, maybe I've got Manchin, but I need uh, Collins. Right. What was it like for her? I know you guys talked on the phone at that, in that yeah. break. Yeah, well, we had met the night before, Susan Collins and me and Lisa Murkowski and Joe Manchin. Um, and some of the discussion was around that affidavit that uh, was signed and uh, that we got corrected. Uh, but Susan was still, I knew, unsettled, as was Lisa on this, and, uh, and Joe as well. Uh, so when Chris and I went in the anteroom, uh, we first <laughs> talked alone until our colleagues realized what we might be doing. Mm. And then one by one, they came over, and then it got rather heated. Um, and there's a very small little corridor there. The press was right outside, so whenever anybody would open the door, there were cameras uh, shooting in and reporters starting to wonder what was going on because they had seen us go out there. And pretty soon, uh, you know, after the shouting match that started to occur, my colleagues saying a, a delay won't change anything. There'll be a million new allegations. Uh, it, it won't change any minds. It'll just, it will be worse off a week from now. Um, and finally, I said, I just want to talk to Chris. And so we 
holed up in a little phone booth that's there with a glass, uh, you know, window there, and and my colleagues kind of you know pressing up against the glass to <laughs> try to hear what was going on, uh, but. Part of what we were doing in there is uh, calling Susan Collins and uh, Lisa Mikowski, uh, wanting to, to make sure that they would back me up if I would say, I'll vote to advance the nomination, but will not vote yes unless we have an investigation, uh, or I'll, I'll vote to advance the nomination, but won't vote on the floor yes and, unless we have an SB, FBI investigation. And, uh, and they said that they would back me up on that. Then we got a hold of, uh, tried to get a hold of Chris Ray at uh, the FBI, couldn't, I think he was in Alaska somewhere. Hmm. Uh, so talking to Rod Rosenstein, make sure an investigation of this kind could be done. Uh, but that was an intense uh, hour and a half back there. It, 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 can you imagine, maybe you know, maybe you talked to the leader about it, what uh, McConnell was thinking while you guys were closeted uh, <laughs> there? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I knew that he would not be happy. Uh, you know, John Cornyn was there in the committee, the whip, he was not happy. Uh, none of my colleagues were very happy about this. Um, but uh, but when I When you knew, say not happy, Senator, what do you mean not happy? Just well, uh, not happy, <laughs> certainly uh, not approving uh, of this, mm -hmm. thinking that we had settled this, you know, we, uh, we were all together. Um, and we were going to vote for him, then advance him and get it done quickly. And uh, I, but I knew that uh, obviously they needed my vote. They could, had I voted no in committee, there are ways they could have uh, still got, got it to the floor without a recommendation. That's not without precedent. Uh, so I knew that I, I couldn't sink the nomination there, but I could force uh, an investigation if I had Susan Collins with me. And, uh, and hopefully uh, Lisa as well, and they were willing to do that. And so then I knew that regardless of what uh, the leader thought um, or how he felt, uh, this was the only option forward. You, you see your sense that he really uh, w would, I mean, he needed this. Why yeah, yeah. did he need it? What were the stakes for Leader McConnell at this moment? <laughs> well, we had spent considerable time <laughs> And, uh, and resources and everything to move this forward. Uh, the president was relying on it. We had uh, gone through the whole uh, you know, hearings with, uh, uh, with Blasey Ford and uh, you know, to stop now uh, would have been pretty darn tough. Yeah. And knowing that uh, I think his concern and, and frankly all of our concern was uh, you know, if, if this is successful on with regard to the allegation itself. Now there could have been other reasons to deny him, saying, "Hey, uh, you just your performance before the committee shows that you didn't and wouldn't have the independence uh, that's necessary." Yeah. Uh, but uh, like I said, his record indicated otherwise. But with regard to the allegation, I think all of us were concerned, uh, and I still believe that had. Uh, he been denied had he the vote gone the other way that we would be in in a strange new territory where an uncorroborated allegation uh, from as far as 35 years before uh, could disqualify somebody yeah. um, that uh, that a mere allegation without any corroboration could and that's not a, a place we want to be in I think all of us felt that way the, the vote, of course, is as close as it can be. Right. We'll talk to uh, Senator Collins later today and, and, uh, about uh, her role in that. The, the question for you, uh, I, I think, is, you know, you're leaving, you've watched partisanship really take a hold right. in some way of uh, and division, take a hold of the Congress, the, and now maybe even the Supreme Court. There are people who are very worried that, uh, th that uh, Kavanaugh manifest in some ways a kind of political side, mm -hmm. even if he didn't mean to, a political mm -hmm. side that maybe he carries onto the bench and that the court itself is less sacred in some way mm -hmm. than, it, than it has been in the past. What are your thoughts about that in a big way? Yeah, well, that, obviously that's a concern of mine. I, I, we can't have partisanship on the court. Um, and uh, I was concerned about the his performance in the committee. Um, uh, but like I said, you, when 
all else fails, you look at the record, you look at how somebody has, has performed in a previous position. And, you know, when you're on the, the DC circuit, you're faced with a lot of uh, issues that, that uh, you know, that, that really um, butt up against uh, positions, policy positions, that people, your, your friends, colleagues, uh, people in your party, if you claim a party affiliation, uh, you know, have taken, and and he uh, had never exhibited, you know, any political instincts uh, that we could tell on the court and, uh, you know, on the the uh, D.C. Circuit Court. So, I mean, you you look at that and you think uh, that's what is more relevant, I think, than just about anything is his record, a, a decade long record. So, I, I felt good about that. Um, I. I I think that, you know, advice and consent, that, that's a powerful, you know, sword that we wield here in the Senate, and we ought to be very careful not to put partisans on the court. Um, but I think his, his record had demonstrated that he, that he wouldn't be that way. He wrote the column in the Wall Street Journal yeah. talking about that. I, that. That really didn't have an effect on me as much as looking back at his record and talking to his colleagues because at some point in 10 years, you're going to be faced with, uh, you know, some cases that uh, you could be right or you could be political on. Right. And I couldn't see evidence that he'd taken the political road at any point. Let me ask these guys what we've missed. Mike, what do you got? Uh, after Sir Lee's death, when uh, Leader McConnell tried to hold the caucus together to not hear a nominee, how does he communicate to you, to the other members of the caucus, Well, the leader at that time worked through uh, Chuck Grassley on the committee, and it was basically the, the committee. We we need to stick together and uh, and all say that we'll, you know, only consider this uh, after the election, and the committee did. And so, uh, Leader McConnell really communicated that through the committee. Although he this was this was his his deal. Uh, it didn't originate with uh, Grassley and the committee, uh, but uh, but and I, and I don't remember if it was. Uh, if it was spoken about at one of the, the lunches, it probably was. Um, and he was, uh, Leader McConnell was pretty firm on this. This is what he was going to do. And I think if, if, if I or any member of the committee had said, no, we, we want to hear him, and some of us did later, um, it wouldn't have mattered. He'd made the decision, and he controls the floor. Hmm. Um, the, the leadership controls the floor. So. Well, as I, I watched that, I, I knew that this was going to be a barn burner. <laughs> I mean, it, this was going to be a tough one. Uh, this was the swing vote, and uh, and I knew that it would be big. The first couple of days of the hearing just confirmed that, and it was until the end. Yeah. Anything else we missed? Gabrielle, we okay? Yeah, just uh, when you left the Judiciary Committee after the vote, you went to Senator McConnell's office. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? This is uh, after the vote to advance? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, after we voted to advance the nomination based on the agreement that uh, we would have an FBI investigation, we went to Leader McConnell's office, myself, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, and many members of the Judiciary Committee, and then tried to set parameters for the investigation. Uh, we wanted to make sure, obviously, that the principals uh, would be interviewed, including Mark Judge. And uh, miraculously, uh, they said, yeah, we, we can we can do that. And uh, Why miraculously? Well, uh, you know, we'd been told all week that no, he wouldn't offer anything, uh, you know, substantive and it wouldn't help. We couldn't do that. Um, but all of a sudden we could. Um, we did agree that, uh, that it would be those who had actual knowledge of what went on in the two incidences not uh, the next level, which would have been, I guess, in legal terms, hearsay. I, I had hoped that we would have, have had an investigation uh, that it would have been broader and sooner. Uh, but 
given where we were, uh, we just wanted it to be thorough, uh, you know, with regard to those who had been identified. And I do think it was. I wish the country, uh, I, I, although I, I don't want to get in habit, we shouldn't get in habit of making background checks uh, that are done by the FBI public. That's not a good thing. But in many ways, I wish the, the country could have read this report. I think they would have felt better about it. It was thorough with regard to the people that it interviewed, and it mm -hmm. shed some light on uh, on what may or may not have happened there. So I, I, uh, I felt in the end that we were in a better place than we were before. Maybe not much better, but in a better place.